In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear faithful, we consider the Holy Trinity, the most blessed Trinity today. It is still the beginning of the time after Pentecost. <clears throat> Last week we had actual Pentecost Sunday. And the church sets this Sunday aside to meditate the Holy Trinity because the very life of the Holy Trinity is what we're going to be sharing for the rest of these Sundays after Pentecost. It used to be that the Feast of the Trinity was celebrated at the end of the time after Pentecost, but I don't know when, about a thousand years ago, they moved it to the beginning to show us that this life that you have in the Blessed Trinity is the life that you yourselves carry within you. So since that's what you carry within you, you should learn it first and then live it after that. I probably say the same thing every year, but we've been using white vestments and gold vestments and red vestments for quite a while now. Next Sunday is going to, going to switch to the regular green, uh, because green is the color of, well, the, the fertile color that God has chosen for all of nature. And uh, we use that color to show the life, the life of the Blessed Trinity in the soul. So let's consider a few points why the Trinity, the most blessed Trinity, is necessary. And that God is not just one person, but that he is three. So we have the words of our blessed Lord, which are, uh, if you do not know me, you do not know the Father. Or if you see me, you see the Father. That's what he used with uh, St. Philip on the night of the Last Supper. Our Lord was insisting with them uh, that... Uh, I am in the Father, and you are in me, and therefore we, I am taking you with me to be in the Father, also with me. And Philip said, show us at the Father, and it's enough for us. That's a remark which is a little bit on the um, challenging side. If our Lord says, I'm going to incorporate you into the life of the Father and me, our, uh, St. Philip and the rest should have said, well, that's a wonderful thing. But instead, St. Philip made a remark, which is kind of like, prove it to me. Just show us the Father, and I'll believe it. And show us the Father, it is enough for me. And our Lord said, um, Philip, have I been so long with you all? And you don't know that he who sees me sees the Father. That means the face of our Lord Jesus Christ is the face of God. It's true that our Lord is the second person, and the Father is the first Holy Ghost to the third, but when we see our Lord Jesus Christ, we already see divinity. So here we have some words that show us that the Blessed Trinity, the, the God, is more than one person. And we have other words. We have our Lord saying, um, if anyone love me, the Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode with him. This means that the Blessed Trinity is in heaven. If you love them, They'll, they will come and take this life of the Trinity and insert it into your soul. So we have a good understanding of the Father and the Son, that they are in heaven, that they have a dynamic life in heaven, and they wish to incorporate us into that life, and they wish to come to us and put their life into us. And then we have our Lord saying, I must go so that I can, so that I can send the Spirit to you. If I do not go, I cannot send the Spirit. That's what we meditated on last Sunday for Pentecost. So now we know that in order for our Lord to be in a soul and for him to transform a soul, he has to use the Holy Ghost, the third person. So normally we consider the three persons of the Blessed Trinity as they are in themselves and as they are glorious in themselves. But I wanted to start with saying they're so important because they're important to us. If it weren't for God having the second person, that's to say, our Lord Jesus Christ, we would not know God because the second person has shown us the face of God. Huh? And then if it weren't for the Blessed Trinity having the third person, the Holy Ghost, then God would not be able to form his Son in our soul, as we studied last week. So we need the Holy Ghost to transform us in God or transform us in Christ. This is the reason that we need the Blessed Trinity. And when they are in us, by the state of grace, 
they are living their divine life inside of us. So, now that we know this importance of the Blessed Trinity for us, I'd like for you to consider a um, truth that it's one thing to have this reality, the Blessed Trinity in heaven. It's another thing to have us live it here in this life. And I would say the greatest enemy to having the Blessed Trinity live in our soul is not having a pure heart. So some of you have heard me say the word pure and you thought right away, uh, oh, that must be if you have the sins of impurity that the Blessed Trinity cannot live in your heart or your soul. Well, yes, that's part of it, but that's not exactly what I was saying. The pure heart is the one which is humble and disposed to have God live in it. So when we were children and we were baptized, uh, you know, babies and we were baptized, we didn't have any consciousness yet to know what is good and what is evil, or also to um, have a desire to do good, or also to say, well, I, I don't want that good in my life right now. I'd rather choose my own selfish things. So we were innocent in that sense. We didn't have any problem with the purity of heart. But as life goes along, and we've got the state of grace, and we were baptized, and uh, we're, we're becoming more and more conscious, uh, then comes the time where people may have the sacraments, and they may have the catechism. They might even have a good home. But it's decision-making time. And uh, if a person is pure of heart, that's to say, I'm disposed to receiving the truth of God, I'm disposed to being informed by God, informed by the Catholic faith, informed by the catechism. I'm disposed to those sort of things. That means I have a pure heart. So it starts with that. And if I have the pure heart, then the virtue of faith, and actually the whole, uh, let's say, the whole Catholic faith together will grow in my soul. But if I have a lack of purity, and that's to say, if I have a desire to do things my own way rather than be obedient, do things my own way rather than be docile to whatever, whatever authority God has placed over me, well, then I'm placing an obstacle to faith growing in my soul. However, if I'm the other way and I say, well, I wish to be disposed and I wish to be um, pious and obedient and docile, these kind of things, well, then faith will grow. And as a result of faith growing in the soul, the, the purity again grows. So I'd like to take a, a comparison for you, and that is that um, we know at nighttime that we get some light from the moon, all right? Uh, not as much as during the daytime. But we all know, if we do a little bit of science, we know that the moon is not a um, source of light. It's a reflector of light. So where's the moon getting its light from? It's getting it from the sun. And then when this, the moon <coughs> reflects that light, then we re receive some light here. That's a comparison to what I want to say, is that <coughs> on both sides, you have purity in a certain sense. You start with the pure light of the sun, that illumines the moon, and from the moon we receive light here. So you start with purity before, and you have purity at the end. In the, in the middle you have faith. So that's what's going on. If we have a pure disposition, we, we wish to receive the truth of God, our faith will grow. As our faith grows, our purity grows. So what you have here is that purity is the cause of a great faith. The result of a great faith is a greater purity. So purity causes great faith, and purity is the result of the great faith. On both sides you have it. So you must and we must have this disposition to respond to um, the goodness of God. And you know, we have the goodness everywhere. Sorry if I'm speaking a little bit in, a, in an idyllic fashion, like everything is perfect, but there it is. We grow up, we have good parents who give us catechism, the rosary, and education. They make a lot of sacrifices for us. They give us a sense of authority. Uh, we respect it. And we have, that's our, our vision of God, more or less, as our parents. 
you know? And if we have a good attitude towards all that, that means we're having purity, purity of soul. As we grow up, that purity of soul will sort of transfer over to um, loving God and having a pure disposition towards him, and that will make the faith grow. And as a result of that faith, our purity will grow. And that's where we get into, you know, purity, purity as an adult. It has to grow. So, uh, yes, that involves the sin, uh, let's see, fighting against the sins of impurity. That's certainly there. But even more than that, um, we fulfill the will of God, not because it's going to make me uh, have a better position or, or gain something for me, but rather <clears throat> we fulfill the will of God because we wish for God to receive more and more glory. You see, we start with purity, that makes the faith increase. The faith increased makes the purity increase. So in the end, we are serving God and making him into something great, let's so, so, so to speak. We're giving glory to God, not because of ourselves, not because of something we want for ourselves, only what we want for God. And that's that great purity of intention that all of us need. So you can see sometimes when um, people might be apparently working for the glory of God, but they still have a lot of their own like self-motivation, self, self uh, self-centeredness involved. And even though they want to acquire, uh, they're working for God, and they should be designed to acquire something great for God, they're actually kind of working for themselves. We have to be careful of that. I think you all know about the um, encounter that happened between Saint Bernadette and her superior, back when, uh, see, Bernadette had received the visions from Our Lady of Lourdes, and eventually she went on to become a nun, and she was a good nun. She suffered, and... Um, she had tuberculosis, and she suffered because of that. She suffered because of a big, a big wound on her knee, and her mother superior was just kind of, you know, <laughs> vicious towards her. At least that's what I understand. And that's because the mother superior, superior had some sort of uh, jealousy towards St. Bernadette, that she, the superior, didn't receive visions from the mother of God. You know, uh, perhaps the mother superior had some kind of holiness, but not, much as, not as much as St. Bernadette. Anyway, so it's kind of a case where someone seems to be serving God, the Mother Superior, but she still has a lot of serving myself in herself. Her purity of intention has not grown as big as it should be. Whereas Bernadette, on the other hand, she didn't even, she didn't even think about how people around her were mean or wicked or whatever. All, all she thought about was, how much more can I serve God? And she had the purity of intention. So, you know, what is the conclusion for us and what is the, uh, let's say, motivation for us here? If we start with docility, obedience, piety, all these virtues that we sort of associate with children because they're looking towards their parents with this, you know, docility, obedience, and piety. Uh, if we start with that, not just as children, but even as adults, if we start with that attitude towards God, then that will make our faith grow. And it's, you know, if anyone love me, my father will love him, and we will come and make our abode with him. You can hear, you know, the Blessed Trinity wants to come and um, indwell, or dwell in, in us, you see. But you've got to have that piety and obedience and the docility of the child towards God. That's the purity of intention. And then your faith grows, and I don't mean faith in the sense that the Protestants say the word faith, which means just strong, strong, strong sense of belief. No, no. Your faith grows. That means your whole life of grace and the sacraments and sacrifice of self and suffering for the glory of God and, and, and fulfilling your duties because you love God. Your faith grows. And then as a result of that, the purity that you started with increases much more. And that would be the case of what I just described, like the convent of... Um, St. Bernadette, the Mother Superior, she was probably already somewhat holy. She could have been much more holy if she had had the purity of intention that I'm talking about. 
and then Bernadette would be the um, sort of the example on the other side, someone that has, that has purity of intention, therefore her faith grew, and as a result of that, her purity was huge. Um, purity of intention, purity of leaving myself out of all of my purposes. This is all about serving God, you see. That is the life that the Blessed Trinity gives us, you know. If, uh, if God were just sort of out there, not three persons, he would be untouchable. But since he is three persons, all of this life of love of the Blessed Trinity becomes our life. And that's where we get into this purity causes faith and faith increases purity because that is the love of the Blessed Trinity and how it works in our soul. Imagine if we were like the people of God before the coming of the Redeemer. 4,000 years of history of the sons of Abraham. They respected God, they feared God. It was hard for them to love God because they didn't see the face of God and they didn't see his mercy. Uh, they felt very distant from God. Uh, in the Old Testament, there are only some vague allusions to God being more than one person, but they're really prophecies for the future. It's only with our divine Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, that we feel this gap between God and ourselves being closed, especially in his person, because he has the humanity and he has the divinity, and that's what pulls us right into, right into God. And it's such an unfortunate thing that, you know, there's some heretics going around that uh, they'll say, well, yes, uh, our, uh, Jesus, they don't, they, they don't give him any titles, Jesus is great, but he is not God. That's very unfortunate. If we were to leave Jesus not being God, then how do we get incorporated into the Holy Trinity? It's, it's untouchable. You can't get in there. And if you say that there's no Holy Spirit, then you don't have the one who puts our Lord Jesus Christ in our soul. So, you know, we're, we're, we're very fortunate to have the Blessed Trinity, have the Blessed Trinity who takes its life and makes it our life. And then the mechanics are the way explained, the me mechanics of the situation are the way I explained it. I explained it. You have to have that docility that makes the faith grow. As a result of that, you have a huge purity whereby you sacrifice anything to give glory to God. So I uh, try to um, consider these realities. No matter how much we consider the Blessed Trinity, we'll never be able to comprehend it. That means uh, to totally surround the, the, the reality of it and completely grasp all of its, all of its meaning. Uh, no, we'll, we'll never be able to do that. But we have a few glimpses, and it makes perfect sense. It's not against reason that God is in three persons, and each of these three persons has its own particular role to serve, whereby we are incorporated into this blessed trinity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.